Hello, my name is Edwin Towler, I'm a wildlife photographer and filmmaker. I'm really cold, and this is another episode of The Science of Cute. This time, we're looking at species found in the north of the UK. There isn't much high up the UK's hilly northern peaks. A snow bunting's name reflects the kind of weather that often adorns this landscape, and red grouse keep them company. However, by diverting your attention from these feathered mountaineers, you might spot your first grey hare. On a sunny winter day, the hares seem misplaced amongst the brown, earthy tones. This weather is abnormal for winter though. At this time of year, snow and ice are the expected hill toppings, which suit the desaturated hares a lot better. The white coats are only temporary, worn by the hares for the winter period. Come summer, brown coats will be all the rage for any fashionable hare that wants to blend in. Mountain hares are mainly nocturnal, spending most of the day resting. They also spend a hefty proportion of their time grooming. Perhaps personal hygiene is important amongst hare culture, or perhaps there's just not much else to do. Hares are known for their tremendous ears. Mountain hares actually have slightly smaller ears than their more common cousin, the brown hare. Shorter ears make it easier for the hares to keep warm, as their heart doesn't have to work as hard to pump blood to its extremities. Although less common in the UK, mountain hares are the native species. Brown hares were introduced by the Romans around 2,000 years ago, whereas British remains of mountain hares have been dated back over 100,000 years. Adopting a spherical ball of fluff pose helps the hares stay warm by minimising the surface area of their body exposed to the bitter cold. Wedging themselves in amongst the heather shields them from the worst of gale force winds and keeps them out of view of predators. Eagles, stoats and foxes are predators that the hares need to try and avoid. But a major killer of these upland dwellers is actually humans. Mountain hares have been accused of transmitting grouse killing ticks and are consequently persecuted on grouse moorland. Other charismatic mammals can be found closer to sea level. Every 60 seconds in Scotland, a minute passes. Its coastline is a place of rain, mystic wonder, and more rain. If you look out to the cool waters of a lock, a quick flick of something slick might catch your eye. Loch Ness Monster? Or a rogue Scotsman? Maybe. If you wait for it to come ashore though, it may well turn out to be an otter. Otters are part of the mustelid family, like badgers and weasels. Eurasian otters are most often found in lakes, rivers and canals. But these particular otters have developed a taste for Gaelic seafood. Young otters are called pups and are distinguishable by their fuzzier coat. Pups will stay with their mother for over a year, and although they are terrifically sweet, the problem with being an aquatic fluff noodle is in fact the fluff. Young otters have a hard time learning to dive due to the buoyancy created by air trapped in their fluffy coats. Excuses aside, at around 16 weeks old, otter pups are forced to learn to hunt for themselves by their mother. Fish and crustaceans, like crabs, crayfish, and for the more discerning otter, lobsters, are the main delights on an otter's menu. They have been known to eat eggs, birds, and even small mammals too. Being mustelids, otters are incredibly playful creatures, especially the youngsters. The rough and tumble ballet of biting has no preferred stage, and otters will play anywhere, on land, or in the water. As for most animals that play, the activity strengthens physical abilities, hones important survival skills, and is really 
really good fun. Mucking about in the murky depths all day can leave an otter rather filthy, so they always appreciate a good cleaning session. A really good cleaning session, often using rocks to scratch those hard to reach places. After a good scratch, they return to the water to hunt. Otters can close their ears and noses whilst they dive, and the combination of short legs and a long tail streamline them in the water. Their eyes are placed high on their heads to let them see above the surface while they swim. Unfortunately, one of the main threats to these otters is habitat destruction and the increased prevalence of roads and traffic. So if you're driving around the Scottish shoreline, please do take care. Hello, I'm looking for mountain hares. Now in the UK, most of the population of them is in Scotland, but there is one population that still lives in England, and that population lives in the North Peak District, which is where I am now. Now it's pretty, it's pretty bleak, um, <laughs> but these these mountain hares are a lot more or a lot better suited for for this environment than I am. I am bloody freezing. Oh. And I still haven't seen any yet. And the visibility isn't great today. So it's gonna be it's going to be a bit of a mission, I think. That's hair poo, which is good because it means the hairs are here. Um, the issue is, at this time of year, the hairs have turned white and when the whole environment looks, well, looks like this, it means they're really difficult to spot. There's no real way around that. Just have to keep looking. So I managed to find a couple of hairs. But the visibility today is just terrible. You can hear from me trying to speak as well. It's so cold. I think we have to leave it for today and come back. So it's, uh, it's hairs one, head nil. Well, good morning. And look at this. We finally got some blue sky. The fog from yesterday is lifted. And because of that, the sun's coming in and it's melting away some of this frost from yesterday which means the white mountain hairs will be a lot easier to spot now. The visibility may be a lot better, but it's still bitterly cold, especially with, with the wind up here. But these little mountain hairs, they have to deal with this all day, every day, for their whole lives. So I've got, I've got a lot of respect for the, for the little hairs. So I just managed to get really close to a mountain hare. It's very obliging, very polite little hair. <laughs> the hair's sort of wandered off now. And you can see behind me, that's where I was filming. So that's where my, my lens and tripod is set up. But then, just a little bit further up here, look what I've found. And what that is, is a balloon from someone's party or wedding. But it just goes to show that even if what you're doing doesn't directly seem harmful for the environment. It can have effects a lot more further afield. Uh, this is only a few meters away from where I was filming that hair nice and close up. And that hair could, could see that as a tasty looking plant or something and have a nibble. And that'd be the end of the hair. So, I don't want to lower the tone of everything, but I think it's good to raise awareness when you see stuff like this. Well, the sun's going down now and I need to, to get off these peaks before it gets completely dark. 